persevering for my team So they can acquire cream Find out what the words pays off really mean Breathing life to a dream My peers wouldn't believe But I'm running out of breath Or I forgot how to breathe It's been colder than ever Nothing like I remember Like spring is the winter And every day is like December So bring out your coats Bring out your sweaters There's no telling when this weather is Gonna get better Cause I remember the moments When I was thought as a joke Now they're giving me handshakes Saying it was a joke But I ain't joking around to be back. Hey, hello, hi. My name is Daniel Blatch and welcome to my second stand-up show. I am very excited to be finally getting this show out um, because I, I nearly died getting to this point in my life and uh, I'll explain why that is. Um, a couple of years ago, I was uh, having a games night with some friends and um, I was driving one of my friends um, home after the games night to their home and as I was walking back to my car, I noticed a guy dressed all in black running right towards me. And this really shows my naivete at the time because instead of quickly getting in the car and driving away, I saw this stranger charging at me in the middle of the night and I said, no, I'll wait. No, he obviously has not something important to say. Look how fast he's running. So, you know, the least I could do is, is, is stay to listen. Um, when this person got closer, I realized that this was one of my friend's exes who did not like that uh, they were spending time with other people and wanted to scare me away from ever seeing them again, which is quite an intimidating situation. Um, I'll be honest, it wasn't that scary at first because as I mentioned, uh, he was just sprinting. And I don't know if you have experience uh, doing a 100 meter dash and then giving a thesis. It's it's quite difficult. You're very out of breath and you're very puffed out. And what makes matters worse, my friend lives on top of a hill. So just imagine the amount of court, like it wasn't, he wasn't a fit man. And, but, you know, I didn't blame him for that. You know, I made sure that, you know, I was very supportive. I was like, don't worry, I'm right here. You're doing great. Um, yeah, so he was uh, basically an Australian version of a thug. Um, for international viewers, how I would describe them is they have the same dress sense as middle-aged suburban mothers. You know, uh, you know, a very stout figure uh, showing way too much arm. Uh, from far away, you can't tell if they're looking for some meth or if they're going to pick their daughter up from school. Either way, they're looking for Crystal. Um, oh, no, that's a that's a dark joke very early on. Strap in, it's going to be a bumpy ride. Um, so, yeah, I, I waited uh, for him to catch his breath like a gentleman. Um, and then, you know, he got up and he looked at me and... I won't say any of the swear words he said because this has been recorded and um, I want to get to the point quickly. Um, but he looked at me and said, and after that I was floored. Um, the joke there is that it was all swear words. Like I, I was honestly more terrified by the language, if I'm honest. Like I had never heard those words strung together so rapidly before. Like I felt like a damsel in the 1800s more. Like just, good heavens, sir! I... Cannot believe you may lock me in the trunk of your car, but may I request a stop on the way home to the soap store because you need to wash your filthy mouth out, you dirty boy. Obviously, I didn't say that. Otherwise, this show would be a lot shorter. Um, but uh, he basically said along the lines of, you should leave. And I said, fair enough. And I got out of there. And it struck me that this was the first adult situation I had ever been in, in the sense that I was alone. I had no one to protect me and no adults telling me what to do. I was the adult in that situation and clearly I was not ready. And that's what this show is about, my transition from childhood to adulthood because I feel like the people that we become as adults would be unrecognizable to us as our kid selves. Uh, for example, uh, my friend Jazz, uh, who I mentioned in my first stand-up show uh, when I went to her 21st birthday party at the rooftop bar, um, she would giggle every time she took a sip of a shot. So she couldn't, she couldn't have the whole shot. She'd only take sips of it. And with every sip, 
I guess like the bubbles or the fumes would just you know tickle her lips and she'd go, <laughs> and now she's on the Supreme Court. She works there. So something has happened between then and now. Like if she went out with her workmates and went, <laughs> they'd go, you're fired. Get out. You're not supposed to be here. So uh, that's what this show's about. The show is um, called Seaside Avenue Drive. Title has nothing to do with the story of the show, really. Um, I just thought I'd name it that because it shares the same acronym as something that I'm often diagnosed with uh, called Social Anxiety Disorder. And I thought I'd bring that up because the acronym to that spells the word SAD, which is just kicking me when I'm down, I think. Like, not only do I have this thing, but even the name is like, you suck so much. Like, it'd be like if you went to the doctors and the doctor said, listen, we've gone through your tests and it turns out you've tested positive for something called Degenerative Cellular Hemoglobin Disorder. The DCHD, what does that mean? It means you're a dickhead. It means you're a dickhead, sir, and there's no cure. It's a, once a dickhead, always a dickhead. Get out of my office, dickhead. So for a while now, I've been trying to figure out how to become an adult, and I thought, well, how does one become a man? Well, from what I've heard uh, is that uh, you become a man through, through sex and, and love. I talked about that uh, quite a lot in my last show. Um, I have had some success in that area since then. Uh, since my last stand-up show, I have had sex four and a half times. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Well, thank you, ladies. Um, you know who you are. When I tell people I've had sex four and a half times, if they haven't run away, they usually have a question afterwards. And I'm sure you have that question you're asking me now, which is, how does someone have sex four and a half times? Like, what's What's half sex? And I'd say that's a very inappropriate question to ask. Like, what are you? This is my private life. You want me to divulge all my personal secrets? You want my bank card too? Like, you just judge the temperature of the room before you talk. Because really, it's not a good look on you. And if you could tell everyone you meet that I have had sex four and a half times, that would be, that'd be great. Um, so I did this sadly uh, through Tinder. Um, not proud of that. Um, I was on Tinder for many, many years. Um, and I can safely say I was rejected by every woman in an 80 kilometer radius. And that stings. But uh, the worst ones were the joke profiles. Uh, sometimes uh, people would make profiles for characters or, or impersonating people that clearly aren't real, like cartoons or video game characters. And, you know, I'd swipe right on them because, you know, I thought it might be, you know, it's clearly someone with a sense of humor. It might be a fun conversation for a few bit, for, for a bit, maybe a story to tell in a stand up show. Um, but it hurts even worse. When you swipe right on the character and then Shrek says no. Shrek saw me and swipe left. How do I live with myself after that? How do I go on? And to make matters worse, you said take it a step further. You got uh, profiles for inanimate objects. Chicken nuggets said no to me. Sand. All of sand. You know how much sand there is in the world? Sand thinks I have a great personality. I can make another inanimate object be very happy. Maybe the chicken nuggets. But it only sees me as a friend. All of sand! Um, occasionally I did get matches with uh, real women. Um, you can clap if you want. Um, I, I had a parade. Uh, but uh, I saved this conversation on my phone because I feel like this is a good example of, of a teaching moment uh, that for anyone out there who is looking to get their soul crushed. Um, so here's, how, here's what happened. I matched with this woman and her profile, um, her bio said, no mom, so car. And next to it was a flag. So obviously it was another language. Um, I didn't know what it was. So I said, hi, no mom, so car to you too. Whatever that means. What does it mean? Ha ha. Now, obviously that ha ha is not genuine, but rule number one, you have to add a ha ha in all your texts just because it gives off the impression that, you know, you're fun and adventurous and, and not intense. All of sand. Anyway, um, so she said, ha ha ha, it means I have no heart. Dark, dark humor, but that's, that's all right. Um, so I reply, ha ha, see, uh, I think I'll have to attract my own no mom so car. What language is that? Ha ha ha. Now, see, she's doing it too. Um, Cute, it's Bosnian. Are you from Bosnia or is that just a language you know? Both, haha. <laughs> so you see, the, the conversation is starting to hit a rhythm. Rhythm is very important because talking to strangers, you know, it's, it's scary. People are afraid of the unknown. So to have that, like, you know when the next beat will be gets rid of 
sort of that unpredictability. And if you can keep that up, you can get to the first state very easily, you'd think. So I said, ha ha, what made you move to Australia from Bosnia? She said war. Just war. One word. No ha ha's. The, the Bosnian war was a, a highly publicized event that happened fairly recently that I should have been more aware of before asking that question. So I politely apologized and I never spoke to her again. And that's the final rule. Know when to stop digging. Don't keep digging when you realize that you're in a volcano. It's just, it's not going to end well. Um, but yeah, I'm not very good at talking to women. Didn't have many role models for what relationships should be like. Like my parents divorced when I was very young, but they used to tell me the story of how they met. Um, they met at a bar. Um, it was actually one of my dad's friends who was drunk um, and was hitting on my mum. And my dad sort of got in the way because he could see that she was uncomfortable. And they bonded over the hatred of this drunk man, which is, you know, it's a great start. And ever since the first date, my dad would ask my mum to marry him every day. Like, and, you know, she would say no, but he kept asking um, because he knew that she would be the woman that he ended up with. And, you know, he was, you know, patient and um you know determined and eventually my mom said yes and the first time i heard that story i thought it was beautiful it, you know it was it, and sweet a proof of love and fate but the more i think about it the more i realize it's actually really creepy because she said no she's made that clear daily you know and and even on the days when they weren't going out on dates or even seeing each other you know he he'd find her and uh, he'd go, will you marry me? Until finally she was probably like, well, divorce is a thing. So if it gets you to stop asking, yes, I'll marry you, you creep. And that's how I was born. Um, that's a creepy story. And I told myself I did not want a creepy story for myself. I will not be a creep. Cut to a couple years ago. I'm in a training session for a volunteering role I'm about to start. Uh, and there's a girl in the class who I decide I'm going to talk to after the class. Uh, which is very out of character for me, but I thought I'd, you know, give it a go. Uh, unfortunately, I think this was around COVID times, so we were asked uh, to leave in halves. Um, so half the group left first and half the group uh, left second. And I was in the half that left and she was in the half that stayed. So I wasn't able to talk to her. Uh, but then I came up with a plan. I thought, I have an idea. There's an alleyway around the corner of this building. I'm just going to hide there in the shadows around the corner. And then when she leaves, I'll jump out and yell, hey, how's your day going? And then I realized, yeah, I'm a creep. I'm a creep. Uh, yeah, I didn't have many role models uh, for relationships. Even my, like my first sort of serious crush was a bad choice. Um, my sexual awakening happened playing Crash Tag Team Racing for the PlayStation 2. Um, and I want that on my tombstone. You can quote me on that. That's, that's very important. Um, the, the character's name was Pasadena Opossum. Uh, she wore a skin tight jumpsuit, like skin tight, and uh, she was from Texas, so she'd call me things like cutie and darling, and that would make my little brain melt. Um, but the problem was, like all the characters in the game, including her, had uh, missions for you to help progress through the game, and most of the missions from the other characters were standard for games. Like they'd be like, "Go to this land and bring me back the black gem," or "Collect all these car parts, and I will build you uh, a new car for the races." Pasadena Opossum's missions were, hey, can I have fifty dollars? Can I? Do you not? Do you not have fifty? What about twenty? Do you have twenty? I'll do a twenty. Can I? Do you have? You have twenty. So can I have it? Can I just? Can I just have it? And even as a kid, I was so confused by her missions. Like they didn't make sense to me. Like this is my money. I earned it. Why would I be giving it to you? But then she'd say, oh, come on, sugar. And I'd go, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> oh, anything for you, Pasadena. <sighs> what happened? Um, I did get to the point where I actually met some of uh, these Tinder women. Um, that's probably an offensive term. <laughs> Tinder women. Get yourself checked. Um. So I got to the point where I met some of these women in uh, real life, and I talk about two of those times. Um, a bit of a humble brag, two women said yes. 
I, I, I was excited to be meeting them in person because I think a big part of why anyone dates is to uh, find where they belong, you know, to find like-minded people and a place to call their tribe. And I didn't have that at the time, and arguably I don't have that now. Bit of a spoiler alert for how these stories are going to go. So I was excited to uh, broaden my horizons and go places I would not normally go. And one of those places was a youth church. Because if there's any way you want to go for a potential hookup, it's under the watchful eye of God. And uh, so I did some research on this church before I went. Uh, Their slogan was, we're all about making followers and having a good time, which sounded very culty. Like that made me um, a bit hesitant to go. But then I thought, "Uh, kisses. So I went. Um, Unfortunately, when I arrived, um, I got a text from the girl saying that she had been in a minor car accident and wasn't going to be able to make it. Um, So my first thought was, so church isn't working out for you then, is it? Like you go to church every week you'd think God would have protected you from the car accident. Maybe there is no God. Maybe maybe this whole foundation you've built your life upon has been built on a lie. Obviously, I didn't say that. I replied, oh, I hope you're okay. And um, she said, yeah, I'm fine, but I won't be able to make it. So you don't have to go to the service if you don't want to. And I said, no, I'll still go. And so I went to a youth church on a Friday night by myself. My thinking was I didn't want to let her know that I liked her. The girl I met on Tinder. Here's another uh, tip of advice for people who are on Tinder. They're all desperate. And so are you. Just accept it. Things will go by a lot faster. So I went to a youth church to meet a girl I met online that who I'd never met in real life before. Again, sounds like a cult, but I push on. Um, I go in and all these people are just like, waving back and forth, flailing their arms around, like like really possessed by the spirit or trying to sell me a used car, just like sort of praise him, praise the Suzuki. And I just, like, I felt so out of place straight away. I didn't fit in. I didn't even know when to cheer when they did. Like at one point, uh, the pastor is reading from uh, the Bible um, as opposed to Cat in the Hat, um, obviously the Bible. Um, and he goes, uh, from Romans 6.12, Sin is a dethroned monarch, so you must no longer allow it the opportunity to rule over your life. And someone in the audience yelled, Yeah, monarch! That's a, it's such a weird word to cheer on. It's right in the middle, too. I just, you know, and at the end of the service, um, the pastor said, Okay, so uh, we're going to do a quick exercise now uh, before you all leave. I want all of you to close your eyes. And um, then we did. And then he said, All right, um, now this is completely anonymous. I want you to. Raise your hand if you believe in God. Completely anonymous. And there was a pause. And then he actually said, still waiting on a few more hands. And I was like, this is a cult. I'm in a cult right now. And he's like, three more, then we can go home, Avery. And it's like, all right, I'm, I'm leaving and I'm not going to come back. But then I got a text from the girl saying, maybe I'll see you there next week. And I said, yeah, absolutely. I loved it. Um, yeah, I actually did go back the next week. Um, I drew the line when they started handing out small cups of homemade wine, and I said, okay, I'm not that stupid. Let's just, I, I watch the news, I know what it is. Um, the other place I went to was the exact opposite of a youth church, and that was a place called Hindley Street. Uh, for people who are unfamiliar with Hindley Street, it's kind of like hell. It's hell, but it's groovy, you know? Like, it's a lot of nightclubs there. Um, like, Ookie Boogie's Lair from Nightmare Before Christmas. It's kind of like that, but everyone is on drugs. You know, part of the fun for me was to guess what everyone was on. You know, like meth, meth, ecstasy, nerofin. Oh, wow. It is, it is spring. So um, I got invited by a girl and I, I thought it was nice that I was being invited, but I didn't really understand uh, why I was because I, I, I got into the uh, relationship thinking that we'd be more than friends, but I actually, actually made it clear that she wasn't interested in me in that way. And I was okay with that. So, but I didn't really understand why I was still being invited because I'd also made it clear that, uh, you know, I didn't like going outside. I didn't like being in crowds. It made me very nervous and anxious. And so I thought this maybe was done out of pity. And I was like, you don't need to invite me if you like feel bad, like you should go out and have a good time. I don't want to hold you back. 
And um, so she took me aside and she, and she said, uh, Daniel, listen, I don't have the best history with men. I tend to attract a certain type of guy that is bad for me. So maybe I tend to push people away to protect myself. But out of all the men I have ever known, you are the only one who has a car. And I said, I'll go. I'll come with you to Hindley Street. Oh, and it was, it was great. I went to Hindley Street with her and her three friends, all packed in the back. And I went to my first nightclub. And that was a mistake going in. But, you know, I wanted to, you know, give it a try. And I'll never go back because it was, it was just so loud. Like, I know, obviously, it's a nightclub. It's going to be loud. But it was so loud to such a degree that when I spoke and couldn't hear my own voice, I went, Oh, I must not have spoken correctly. I'll try again. It was that, and the floor was sticky. That I often wonder what was making the floor so sticky, but I never ask out loud because some questions you don't want the answers to. And the DJ was so rude. Like, he was the only one anyone could hear, and he was just yelling, everybody fucking jump. No, I can't see anything. If I jump, I'll fall over and be even more lost. And why is it so hot in here? Actually, it's not even that hot, but the warmth is dense because these people don't know personal space. You know, and in that moment, I stopped being scared. Like, usually I am scared to be out at all, especially in large groups of people. But no, I wasn't scared anymore. I was angry. And the girl noticed and she like, was like, what's wrong? And I, and I told her, I said, because I know why these people are here. These people are here because they have problems in their lives that they don't want to deal with. They come here to simulate blindness and deafness to numb their lives and just pretend they don't exist for a few minutes, which is just so insulting to me because everyone has problems. I have problems, but I was taught to deal with them or at least live with them. But no, no, these people, all they want to do is just pretend they don't exist and just move on with their lives so that nothing ever gets solved ever, which would be fine if they weren't doing it so obnoxiously that now they are drawing the attention of other people who will now think it's okay to join them and continue this behavior. These people are what's wrong with society, and I'm so angry that I am a part of it. The only problem was because the music was still too loud, all she heard was... So uh, we figured out a way to communicate uh, through texting, um, and I texted her, listen, I'm going to go to a different club now. It's called Waiting in My Car. And so I left. I um, I was just, I was so tired. I was stressed. I hadn't eaten or drunk anything in hours because I didn't know what they were putting in the food. It could have been a Nurofen. And I just, I hated everyone around me. I found my car. I got in. I felt like I was going to pass out. But then I checked my phone and I realized it's midnight. It's a new day. And that meant the games on my phone had daily prizes for me. <laughs> and I just, I just started weeping with joy because I, I know mobile games aren't for everyone, but to have a thing on your phone just reward you for getting through the day, it really means a lot to me. I played a game called Leap Day and I unlocked this guy. His name's LeBeef. And that was the best part of my night. And that's when I realized what I want. Like a lot of people want a lot of people around them to give them comfort and belonging, but that's not what I need. So I should stop chasing it because this is what I want. <laughs> Look at his little briefcase. <laughs> See, I don't need something big like God or Lizzo. You know, I don't need any of that. You know what I need? I just need a root. I, oh, no, sorry. That was actually a poor choice of character. Because root means... Um, I'm sorry. That was... I'm sorry. Um, another way I was taught to um, become an adult and become an, become an adult and become a man uh, was to get a job. And I think uh, since I'm still on YouTube, it's safe to say that isn't going well either. Um, my first interview uh, was at a small accounting firm. Uh, I drenched my shirt in sweat with the nerves, but before I got there, the receptionist said, uh, can I take your coat? And I took it off, and then she said, no, you should leave that on. It's going to cover up the stains. Um, and so I got in, and the interviewer said, 
try not to think of this as an interview, okay? This is just going to be a casual chat for 30 minutes to get to know you. I can see that you're nervous, you know, but, but just try to relax. And I said, shut up, I'm fine. <sighs> the, the, there's something in the roof. There's something in the roof. I hear it. And he said, yeah, you look fine. And his first question was, what do I think my greatest strength is? And I don't remember exactly what I said, but it was something along the lines of, I think, well, I know that my, because there's so many to choose, not that, like, I don't want to be arrogant, but I want to, you know, put my best. And, you know, even if, like, I just, I want, because this is, imp I, I would like to, because in different angles, different environment, like Pythagoras theorem tells us that when you look at it from a different, and I want to, I just, like, I'm good, I'm a great, I'm, I need you to like, I had a hard time at school. And when you think, like, maybe a list, maybe a list would, because if I could just, because there's a range, there's a rainbow and a red and yellow and pink and, and you know, there's more so. And if you want to just, and even if, even if, because you look, you look, and over, I just, I would, even if, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm a perfectionist. And he said, well, we're out of time now. We'll call you. They didn't call me because I'm terrible at talking. Um, you know, I try to avoid it at all costs. Um, and I worry sometimes that maybe that gives off the wrong impression of me as being rude or standoffish, which can be dangerous in this day and age. Like, like, like I've never met a transgender person before, I don't think. Um, but I just imagine, like, if I ever did meet one, um, how the conversation would go. And they would probably say, um, uh, hi, Daniel, I am a, I'm a transgender female. And what that means is I was born in a man's body, but I identify as female. I have recently accepted this part of my life and have begun the long process of uh, making my outsides match what I feel on the inside, which uh, includes a lot of surgery uh, and estrogen therapy, which can really take its toll. So I hope I have your support in this. because. To have a good uh, support network at this time, it it cannot be undersold how important that is because I'm still me. I'm still a person and I still matter. And then it would be my turn to talk and then I'd say, yeah, and how's the weather too? You know what I mean? Just like, oh my God, it, it feels like 22, but it says it's supposed to be 20. Like, you know... It's actually supposed to be 21, but still, that's a, that's a disparity. Anyway, see you later. And that's not me being rude. I'm not trying to be, like, I don't care what, you know, gender, race, sexuality, or however else you identify. I'm afraid of you all equally. And that's true equality in my eyes. Like, I'll look in the mirror and I'll go, I'm being robbed because it just, I'm afraid of you all. Um. What was I talking about? Jobs. That's right. <laughs> Get back on topic. So um, despite my inability to talk, um, I still had to go on all these interviews and they were all terrible, um, especially the group interviews. Oh my, they're the, we've all been in that situation where you're sitting in a group and then the person running the group says, let's go around the room and introduce ourselves. And I just, look, if you're one of those people that says, let's go around the room and introduce ourselves. What I'm about to say may sound harsh, it may sound mean, it may be cruel, but it just, it needs to be said. If you're one of those people who says, let's go around the room and introduce ourselves. And again, I know this may hurt to hear, um, it may, may hurt your feelings, but this is the truth, all right? It needs to be said. If you're one of those people, when you die, no one will care. And again, I know that's awful to hear. Just tell, I would be upset. And you know, it's not too late to change your ways. You, you can be a better person. I am choosing my words very carefully. But at the moment, when you die, there's going to be a public holiday celebrating it, honestly, because you say this, that's what you are. You know, no one likes it and you keep doing it. And you always change the formula like slightly every time just to make it even more painful. Like, like, okay, let's uh, pair up and talk to your partner for five minutes. And then when we come back, you're going to introduce them to the group or, 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 or tell us your name. Let's go around the table. Tell us your name and then tell us a hobby that begins with the first letter of your name. Or, or, or let's cut off our fingers with rusty scissors. 
You know, we'll pass them around, pass them around, and cut off your fingers with rusty scissors until blood is pouring into the bowl at the centre of the table. Then we will do some demonic chanting, where a demon named Nogal will rise from the blood and hellfire, and if he points at you, tell us something fun you did this summer. It's exactly the same. It's exactly the same as how I'm saying. So because of an attitude problem, no, I did not get that job at Westpac either. There's a... Don't worry, I'm, I'm calm now. So, <laughs> Nogal is gone. Don't worry about him. Uh, so, none of this was working out, so I decided to apply for some volunteer roles because they were easier to get. Um, they didn't pay, but they'd be something to add to the resume to help me get like, uh, like a paying job, like a full-time paying job, which is something that I wanted to do. Um, so, I, so I got my first volunteering role at, um, at a youth center in a bad neighborhood. Um, I describe my bosses as... It's like working for people who have severe OCD, but are also so sleepy. Like, it's just, like, they come to me and say, all right, Daniel, I need you to go through uh, the master spreadsheet by hand, uh, this thousand of entries by hand, and identify every email address that begins with the letter J. Count them, then times that number by three. That is the amount of times you need to turn the light switch on and off every morning, otherwise my mother will die. And I'd be, like, that's... Sounds very complicated and personal. Are you able to help me with that at all? And they go, I would, but I just, oh, man. I'm just so sleepy. I've been in meetings all day. Really? What were the meetings about? You don't want to know. And I, <laughs> that's my favorite joke, I think. Um, if anyone from the youth center is watching, I'm sorry, but it's true. So, <laughs> Uh, but this one's going to make fun about me, this next joke. Um, so um, working at the youth centre, I learned what kind of impression I'm giving off to people. Uh, someone at the youth centre came up to me unprompted um, and said, you know who you remind me of? Have you ever seen that show You on Netflix? You remind me exactly of the main guy from that. The main guy from You, the psycho stalker murderer who becomes obsessed with women, ruins their lives and kills them on a yearly basis since 2018. And I'd say, I, uh, what? Why? Why? What have I done to d deserve that comparison? And they'd say, oh, it's something about your eyes. I can tell that you're scheming something. I'm not scheming anything. I'm not, I'm, I'm not doing anything. And they'd say, yeah, you can say that, but you can't fool me. It's like, what is happening? You know, but aside from all that, you know, I was getting happy. You know, I was enjoying working at the youth center and, and it gave me plenty of time to work on my YouTube stuff, which is uh, something that I enjoyed as well. Um, so yeah, I was getting happy. And then um, about a year later, I got a job. It wasn't uh, full time. Um, it was only part time, short term, but it was my first paying job. Um, and that was exciting. And um, I was also, you know, eager to accept it because I was a bit nervous about leaving the youth center behind because I was actually enjoying working there. But having this part-time thing made sure that I was able to do both. Um, at this new job, um, I was in charge of the phones. So any mistake I made at that job, I will not take the blame for because they knew, they knew how bad I was at talking and they still made me do it anyway. Like, I, I don't know what happens. I think I just panic. And instead of like, like if someone talks to me, I'll just race through all the possible responses that I could say to them. And instead of choosing one, I'll say them all at once. Um, that's actually probably happened a couple of times <laughs> in this show. Um, and the worst case of that happening uh, at the job was um, I was on the phone with someone and I had to put them on hold. And I couldn't decide between saying, I will put you on hold or putting you on hold now. So I said, I will hold you now. And then I... And that, and that was bad, but the worst part was that the whole music at this company sounded like the, the background music to a porno from the 80s. So all they heard was, I will hold you now. And then... They hung up. And you know what? Good for them. I would have lost respect for them if they had stayed. Um, and then coming to the end of that job, uh, I was in a small car accident. 
Um, I was being waved through traffic by a guy who I now know was the devil. Um, and he said, everything was fine. And I got T-boned. Um, and I was at fault there. Um, I saw the devil drive off twirling his handlebar mustache, I swear. Um, and everyone was fine. But all the money I had earned up until that point went into the repairs, which was the start of a weird association I would begin to make in my mind regarding work and money. Because I would have been able to keep all that money if I hadn't gone to work that day. But I, I, I would have never, you know, had lost that money. Let me start again. <laughs> See, this is the mind of a crazy person, so it may require a couple explanations. All the money I had earned up until that point, I had lost. I would have been able to keep that money if I hadn't gotten in that accident in the first place. But I, I never would have, you know, been in that accident if I hadn't gone to work to get the money. So work now equals no money. Like, what was I supposed to gain from this? And then a year after that, I got my first, like, real job. Like, a real full-time paying job. I did it. The thing that I had been working towards the thing that I was told what school was for, what university was for. This is the reason I'd done all that, and I finally had it. I did it. It meant that I had to say goodbye to the youth center and that I couldn't uh, do YouTube anymore because I wouldn't have time to make the videos that I wanted. Uh, and that was sad. <clears throat> and my voice broke at just the right time. Um, and that was sad. Uh, but the youth center people, they, um, you know, they were happy for me. And... Uh, you know, I knew this was something that I had to do. Uh, so um, my first day there, there were hundreds of people there, hundreds of people. It was a training day, um, and the trainers uh, all said, um, we know that you're un in an unfamiliar environment filled with um, unfamiliar people, but we want you to take the time to get to know the people next to you and across from you because this is your new family, okay? This, all of us, all 100 of us, we are your new family, okay? New family. Which I thought was a bit presumptuous of them, implying that we didn't have families already. Like, excuse me, I have a wife and two children at home. It's like, no, we got rid of them. They're gone now. You family. Uh, and so I started working there. Um, it was a big open plan office, so we all worked in the same room. We were just at different cubicles. Uh, actually, not even cubicles, because we only had two walls. So it worked at Cornicles. Um, and there were no windows in the office, so we could never see outside or hope ever. Um, but the higher ups, uh, they thought a good way to solve this would be to get giant murals of landscapes put on all the walls. So when you look around, you think to yourself, I'm not depressed, I'm in a field. Um, and we weren't allowed to do work. That was the main thing. Like if we did too much work, we'd get reprimanded. There was at one point a newsletter that went out saying, there's a small group of people that are doing too much work and they are making us look bad. And it just, it was, so once again, this association between money and work was being reinforced. At my first job, I worked, then lost all my money. Now I'm at a job where I do nothing and get to keep it all. Like all the rules of logic that I've been building up ever since I was a kid were just getting broken one by one at this place. I was, I was genuinely losing my mind. Now this next bit is going to sound crazy. As opposed to the rest of the show. I, this, this next bit is going to sound crazy and paranoid. I know that. But just listen to this. In the office, they had mounted uh, TVs on all the walls. And uh, on the TVs, they had a looping PowerPoint presentation about the company's values. And the values for the company spelled out the uh, word FOCUS, the acronym uh, FOCUS. Uh, the TV that was always in my line of sight was where they kept the whiteboards. And the whiteboards were just tall enough to block out the last letter of the word focus. So every day I would look at a TV saying, fuck you. And I was like, fuck you too. Son of a. It, and you know, everyone was so happy for me. Every, oh, they were so. There's something about you now. So, you're so much better and brighter. Are you happy? Because you must be happy. You look happy. Are you happy? Because I'm happy that you're happy. You must be happy, aren't you? Aren't you happy? And I hated getting talk like that because I just, I, I, not even, I, I, I poop blood. Yep. On my first day there, I was not in the office, but I, I was so tensed up that I couldn't go to the bathroom at the office. And so when I got home, I pooped blood 
And I don't know if many of you have experience in that area of pooping blood, um, of blood coming out of that area. Actually, a specific portion of you may have some experience in that area. Uh, but the first time it happens, really any time it happens, it's scary. Okay, because, you know, I believe that blood should be in the body, okay? That's what I believe, that's what I was taught. I'm sorry if that sounds old-fashioned to you, but that's just, that's my truth. So I'm being physically, mentally, and emotionally drained. I have proof that I'm dying, but everyone around me is saying, oh, but your aura feels so much nicer. My aura, my aura, you mean the thing that isn't real and doesn't help me in any way, they say, yeah, you have a nice aura. And I'd say, oh, yeah, well... And I go, what are you doing? I'm sending a message to you with my aura. And that message I'm sending to you with my aura is shut up because it's not okay. Oh, and small talk. Oh my God. I recently learned what small talk is. Small talk is when people are talking about something that they don't even care about. Well, I, this is a real conversation I dedicated to memory because it was so shocking. I saw these two people walking past each other and this is exactly what they said. Hey, I got that vacuum cleaner. That new vacuum cleaner you were talking about? Yeah, that new vacuum cleaner. Well, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. And then they just walked away. The only reason that conversation should have ever been said out loud is if the two people were walking past each other the next day and said, well, I tried the new vacuum cleaner. It turns out it's not big enough to hold the whole corpse. It's like, well, well your ex-wife was a big woman. You could try mine if you wanted. Well, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Like, do you want a story worth telling? I'll tell you a story worth telling. One time, I nearly got my penis ripped off during a one-night stand. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to talk about it. Just because, um, this is why it's four and a half times. Um, that's what the half was. But I just, no, I shouldn't. I shouldn't because it's, you know, it's private and it's, it's personal and it's, it, it, it's inappropriate too. So what happened was I matched with this girl on Tinder and, um, you know, we'd been talking for a while. Things were getting more romantic. And then out of the blue, at least from my perspective, she said, I want to have sex with you. And no one had ever really said that to me before. I didn't know how to respond. So I replied, sounds fun. Ha <laughs> ha. So you have to add the ha-has. All of sand. Anyway. So uh, she asked, you know, like, what, what are you into? Like, what do you like in bed? And um, I said sex. You know, but if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, uh, um, I do like the idea of threesomes, though. Like, just to, to be in a situation where two women at the same time care about my feelings is just it blows my mind that that's that's possible um so she didn't get the sort of dirty answer that she wanted and so she said well well i'm into bbcs um for those of you who don't know what a bbc is good i envy you i used to be one of you because i foolishly asked what's that and um so she sent me some videos it's not even pictures, moving videos, moving pictures. They were moving. Um, so this next joke is just between the people who know what BBCs are. Um, for people who know, I want you to picture one in your head. I'm sorry, but just picture one in your head and then look at me. Do you see the issue here? I'm, I'm translucent. That's not going to... Like, did, are you sure you, like, did I use the right profile pictures? And so she's like, don't worry, we're, we're going to have a good time. And, um, so we end up having sex. Um, she decides that she wants to, uh, finish me off with her hand. And so she, um, you know, takes me in her hand and I just realized that my parents are going to be watching this. Um, to my mom, I'm sorry. Um, to my dad. High five, you know what I mean? <laughs> you, taught, you taught me well, you taught me well. Um, my dad's advice for Tinder when he found out I was using it was to just make sure that I spread my seed, uh, which was the exact opposite of the advice that he gave my sister, which was, I'm taking your phone. Um, and so, you know, she wanted to finish me off with her hands. Um, hand, let's 
let's be real here. Like, <laughs> I get I'm doing a stand up show about myself. It's kind of narcissistic, but let's be honest, hand, not both. Um, so she was using her hand, and I don't know why. Uh, maybe this was some uh, manifestation on her part. Like, maybe if I pretend it's a BBC, it will become much, much bigger. It didn't. Um, and that's that's what half sex uh, is. Uh, it's when you know you're about to finish, and then the girl says, "I'm gonna make a balloon animal instead." And there, so there was a lot of twisting and pulling and folding, like just like tying the knot and just putting it to. It's a giraffe. No, it's my penis. Put it back. And I just, it just hurt. I couldn't, you know, stick with it. And I, I knew it wasn't going to end. And so I just said, "I'm sorry." Um, and she was disappointed, and you know, so was I. I thought maybe I'd done something wrong. Um, I get home the next day, and as I'm getting changed, just on my penis, I notice just a little, like just a tiny, just a tiny little. <laughs> there was a small tear on my, because she was pulling. She tried to rip my dick off. But you know what? I'm lonely, so I reply. Hey, let's see if you can finish what you started. You know what I mean? You know, tomorrow night, you're free. And um, she said, this, uh, this was just a one night thing for me. Um, and so I never saw her again. And, you know, I, it wasn't going to work out anyway, but, you know, rejection hurts no matter what, I think. Um, and yeah, my penis is fine, by the way. Um, no one ever asks whenever I, you know, no one ever says, Oh, I hope your penis is fine, Daniel. Or hope your genitalia is healing nicely, Daniel. They just say, why are you telling me this at two in the afternoon? And I say, because what else are we doing, Jeffrey? They won't let us work. We may as well have small talk. And this is what small talk should be. This is why no one talks to me. <laughs> um, just quickly to wrap that story up. Um, we talked a few more uh, times before uh, she went back home to Thailand. Um, the last thing she ever said to me was, I feel pregnant. And then I never heard from her again. So if I have a Taiwanese child out there, I hope you're well. Uh, next time you see your mother, um, I just I learned this Thai saying um, that you can um, pass on to her uh, just to let her know. Um, uh, just this, this Thai saying, if you could pass that on to her. Um, it's, it goes, Why you are Fez Con Chan, me Penrai Kukun Tam. Uh, which in English translates to, my penis is fine, by the way. Thanks for asking. Because she never asked either. Still not over it. But anyway, so back to the call center job. Uh, <laughs> back to, uh, let's, let's go back to the comedic heist that we were reaching before, before we started talking about balloon penises. Um, Gives a whole new meaning to the term I got my cherry popped. But no, 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 no. We're going back to the the job. Call center. We're at a job. Just, if we can all <laughs> bring it back. I'm sorry. Mum. Uh, <laughs> so at the call center. And then one day my account just stops working. Like not my computer. It meant that whatever computer I logged into, I could not do the minuscule amount of work they gave me every day. And this didn't get fixed for a month, which meant I couldn't do anything for a month. I need to get this point across because I feel like it's not setting in. We weren't allowed phones on the work floor or pens or paper or anything. I had to sit there and do literally nothing for a month. It was like solitary confinement, but worse because there were people there and I just, I sat there for a month, did nothing got paid for it, and at the end, they promoted me. They just, you know, you do nothing so well, we're going to get you to do even less of it. Or more of it. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters. Um, so sitting there for a month really gave me time to think about things, um, like what I'd done to deserve this, what past sin was I atoning for, um, look, why, why was I here? Because I said that I wanted this job. That's what I've been saying. But did I really? No. I, I, I applied for this job because I thought that's what would make people happy. That's what they would want me to do. 
So why was I here? You know, what was it the money? Because I was making money on YouTube. It wasn't a lot, but it was enough to support my lifestyle of bread and rainwater. And that's that that that's fine with me. I mean, I was making more money here, but what was the point of it? Saving up for a life that I didn't know if I was gonna have. Like I don't know if I'm gonna get married. I don't know if I'm gonna have kids. I don't know what I want. And I remember as a kid I went to the toy store to get some incredible Hulk toys. And there are four in the line and my mom said I could only have one. I just couldn't decide. And so my mom said, All right, fine, you can get two. And I told her, I just can't do it. And she said, All right, fine, we'll get you all four. And I said, No. And she was confused and rightfully so, because I don't know what I want. You know, I, I want to be happy. I know that. You know, at the youth center, I was happy because there was work to do, things to do. Yes, sometimes there'd be long stretches of time where nothing was happening. I'd just be sitting in my chair, but then they'd make up for it by saying one of the kids lit another kid on fire. And I'd say, thank you. It's about time. Gave that kid a lighter like an hour ago. So don't, that's, that's not real. So, but I wanted that, not this. I didn't want this. I wanted that. And I realized that, and I think this is a realization that we all have to come to at some point in our lives, that I would rather be poor and do something than rich and do nothing. And so I quit. I arguably quit that job to do this stand-up show. Um, I may come to regret that decision. I'm kind of regretting it now. Just look at the view count. But um, for the most part, it was it was worth it to me. And so I went back to volunteering. And on my first day back, I locked myself out in the garden. I didn't realize that the door needed a key. It'd been a while since I'd been there. Um, and I left my phone on my desk so um, I couldn't call for help. And so for the first time in six months, I actually did something. I stack some chairs to climb over a fence. I jumped over. I hadn't climbed anything in years. I hadn't done anything in for so long and it, it felt great. You know, I climbed over the fence, got back to the street and I started walking around. And then there's this old guy from across the road who sees me and he goes, hey! And I, I look at him and he's gesturing for me to come over to talk to him. And Normally, I'm a strong advocate for stranger danger. Don't talk to anyone you don't know. Don't talk to anyone you do know. Stay inside. Shut the blinds. Life is scary. But I look at this guy and he was old. He had no shirt on. He was just wearing boxer shorts. He was using a walker to get around. And he was carrying a bundle of sticks that he had been collecting on the sidewalk. So I thought if it came down to it, I could take him out. And so I said, hello, new friend. How can I help you today? Uh, and he said, you. You. Very intense. Um, have I taught you about the ha-ha method? Can I have those? Um, no, he said, he said, you. You are happy, but ugly. And I, I thought I'd maybe misheard him, like, because he was a little bit incoherent. So I said, I'm sorry, did you, did you, did you just call me ugly? And he went, huh. he didn't even say yes. He was just like, yeah. And so I looked at him, stole all his sticks and ran back to work. And I was happy. And now I'm going to take a drink because I'm losing my voice. I'm running a bit over time. That's not good, but that's, that's fine. Um, but yeah, I'm 25 now. So I kind of feel like I'm running out of time to become an adult because I, I'm the same age that my parents were when they had me, which, which shouldn't mean anything, you know, like life isn't a competition, but if I were them, I'd be rubbing it in my face a little bit. You know, if I were my dad, I would go, ah, oh, 25. Are you dude? You know, by the time I was 25, I was a man. You know, I, I, I had a loving partner, a child on the way, and I had my dream job, and I was able to grow facial hair. Not that, you know, you got to do something about that mustache, man. It's, it's too whispery. So, but you know, I did it. I had, the, I had the wife, the child, the job. I had everything I wanted by the time I was your age. 
But you're doing all right, aren't you? you are uh, got a YouTube channel. They don't just give those out to anyone. Um, but not only that, is um, people my age now are having kids as well. People that I went to school with um, are having kids, and they all say the same thing. They all say, we don't know how it happened. We don't know how it happened. We just, we've been together for a while, and then all of a sudden, we were pregnant. We don't know how it happened. It's a miracle. We just, we don't know how it happened. Well, I know. You sent me the video. Look, it's on here. Like, it's, oh, sorry, it's Snapchat, so there's an ad in the middle. Uh, but th- there you go. That's the, that's how it happened. Do I like this? Or like, what do you want from me? Um, so it just makes me think that maybe there's something we have been missing out on sex ed, something that we're all forgetting because of all these, got all these accidents. Like, I'm not exaggerating here, but every single person I know was an accident. And if they aren't in the literal sense, then they sure know how to act like one. And, you know, it just makes me think, like, maybe there's something being left out of sex ed. You know, like, like to avoid pregnancy, here are a few steps you can take. Step one, contraception for the man. This usually uh, is uh, it's a condom, uh, mainly in the form of a condom. Uh, step two, contraception for the female. There are many more forms uh, for, for women. Um, there are female condoms, IUDs, birth control pills. They're all equally effective. They don't all need to be used, but at least one should be um, in effect. Uh, step three, remember to touch a lemon an hour after the sex. Uh, what? Sorry? What? What was that last one? Is that, yeah, you got to touch, you got to touch a lemon at least an hour. Honestly, those first two things don't do anything. The lemon part, that is the most important thing to remember. And if you don't do that, then you are guaranteed to be getting pregnant. So, oh, okay. Honey, we forgot to touch a lemon. Oh, okay. Well, that is... So, are you picking up Brayden Lee from school, or is that me? Um, but yeah, I don't, I'm not sure if I should have kids, not because I didn't have good role models as parents, you know, I, I, I love my mom, and I, I love my dad, uh, who isn't racist, by the way, despite how hard he tries to make you think he is. He just, I love my dad, uh, but he's just, he pushes the line between, <laughs> for what's, allowed to say i think like we're in a very pc era he d- he's not racist he's just descriptive like he likes to tell stories you know he'll come home from work and he'll say oh boy the week i had at work there's this new guy just started took the first four days off just started took four days off then he came back didn't know what he was doing stuffed up everyone's work so now we have even more work to do Next week. Asian. What? Sorry? What? Why are you... So- what? What's the problem? Is it, I, I, why did you say he's Asian? Do you... Do you not like Asians? What? What? No, of course not. I'm just... I'm just I'm giving you details on the story. I, I'm doing this for you. It's a, irrelevant, but... Okay. Um, so there's this other guy at work. Um, challenges me on every decision I try to make. Even when he knows I'm right. Makes the whole day go... So much slower. Indian. Dad, that's you, That's racist. And it's like, what's racist about saying Indian? Well, I like to paint a word picture. I like to paint a word picture. And you should think I'm the exact opposite of racist. You know, I work in a multicultural place, clearly. And all these people are on my team. None of them work for me. I work with them. And that's the best way to get a job done. Having different mindsets, different peoples. That's the only way to get things done, honestly. And if it wasn't for them... I would not be in the position I am right now. We work together as a team. And I, I wouldn't have it any other way. So, all right. I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you. You know, I learned so much about their, their cultures and, you know, where they come from. And my impression of Chinese people has gotten so much better because of it. You want to see? I don't know. No, no, no. Just... Um... But yeah, I don't know if I should have kids, not because of them, but because I'm worried that I may have some things that I may pass on genetically, um, because I, I, um, I might be autistic. Um, you're probably watching thinking that was literally the first thing I've noticed about you. How do you not see it? Uh, but I'm not, I'm not autistic. I'm not autistic. I got tested when I was uh, young, uh, when I was a baby and uh, the doctor told my parents that. He displays every sign of someone with autism, but we're not going to diagnose him today. Which is basically the same as saying, 
it looks like your son has no arms, but catch. And it just, but I'm not, I'm going to take his word for it because I'm not autistic. Like, you know, I'm not autistic. I just uh, was nonverbal for a very long time. Um, you know, I, I didn't say my first word until I was four, not because I couldn't. I just had nothing to say. You know, I just, I remember my mom trying to get me to speak and going like, say mama, say mama. And in my head, I was like, mother, listen. I was four. Mother, listen. We both have other things we could be doing right now. I have a poopy diaper. You have a failing marriage. We're both very busy. So let's reconvene when we're more available after I finish smearing spaghetti on my face. Blah. But I'm not autistic. You know, I'm not autistic. I just, uh, I don't like loud noises. You know, I, I don't like getting screamed at. Um, I have an intense fear of the birthday song for that specific reason. Um, I think it was my eighth birthday and everyone was just screaming that song. I was getting so upset. And there was this one kid that was really getting into it. And, you know, at the end where it's like the happy birthday to, and he got right in my ear and shouted, yeah. And I got so overwhelmed that I slapped him in the face. And it was a real, like a solid slap. Like it would have been impressive if it wasn't a child. And I just, my hand was ringing. The shockwave knocked out the candles. Like it was just, and you know, he was crying and I was crying. And my parents took us aside and um, they made me apologize to him uh, for slapping him in the face. Um, but my parents also, God bless them, they made him apologize to me for hurting my hand. And that was, <laughs> that was a great lesson to learn that young. You know, see, son, sometimes the victims are a fault too. Maybe if he were a better friend, he would have better reflexes. So, but I'm not autistic. I'm not autistic. I just, I sometimes say things that would be inappropriate for a normal conversation or whatever conversation I'm in, or just sort of out of place. Um, but I just have interesting things to say, interesting things to say. For example, I just found out that the porn I watch is made for women and that, you know, that's something that I think is interesting. Um, I found that out because, um, it says on the bottom made for women, um, which I read, which I don't think I was supposed to do because you're not supposed to be doing a lot of reading when you're watching porn. Um, I just keep getting distracted by the story, I think is what the issue is. Um, because there's a series I watch, <laughs> I can't believe I'm about to promote porn, um, use code Daniel at checkout to double the size of any, anyway, um, so there's this series I watch called, uh, Balesa House, and the main, um, you know, premise of the series is that it's porn stars, uh, choosing who they have sex with in the scene, and, uh, are the porn stars, and, um, who they choose, uh, they tell us why they chose who they chose, and that usually comes in the form of a story. And there was this one episode, um, these two people met at an award show and the girl was very nervous. She had troubled public speaking. You know, she had huge boobs, uh, stage fright, uh, huge stage fright, stage fright. And, um, and the guy noticed and he came over and, uh, decided to give her some tips, uh, because you always start with the tip. Uh, no, no, sorry, sorry. That's just, it's a nice story. So let's just, so, um, he came over because he, um, you know, he admitted that he had difficulties performing too, which is the last thing you want in a porn star. Oh, uh, no, all right, all right. That's just, that's my favorite one. Um, <laughs> too easy. Um, and so that's how they met and their friendship sort of blossomed from there. And it was, you know, such a sweet and, I want to say wholesome, but again, that sounds dirty, but like innocent, innocent story. Um, and so by the time, you know, the story's over, it's, it's personal. I feel like I know them and it's like, I, it feels inappropriate to watch them inside each other now. So I'll just, I'm going to leave you two alone. You seem like you're busy. Um, do you want snacks? No? Okay. I'll just get out of your hair. But, you know, I'm not autistic, but all these things were just starting to, to build up and they were making me feel very isolated. And I, I didn't want to feel like that anymore. I didn't want to be alone. So I thought... You know what, I'm going to get retested. I think maybe now, as as a grown man, I can you know get retested and get more accurate result, and maybe finally understand the the reason for these behaviours. And so, I went to the doctors, and um, that's where the doctor told me that uh, the test costs uh, three hundred dollars and goes for five hours. And I said, so what if I'm autistic? Who cares? Like it doesn't matter. Getting a test won't define who I am. It doesn't matter. 
you know, getting labelled. Who cares? I don't, I'm not going to get the test. I don't need it because I'm, I'm probably not autistic. I'm probably, probably not autistic. You have to be able to laugh at stuff like this. I think I get that from my mum. She's always been able to laugh at the, the, the darkest of times. Um, recently, um, our neighbour tried to break into our house while we were still inside because she wanted to fight my mum. Um, she was high. The neighbor, not my mum. Although maybe that would have helped my mum if she was the one that was high. She'd, you know, hear the door banging and someone going, I'm going to kill you. And she'd go, what I do to you, door? And, but, you know, it's very scary. She was like, banging on the door, like trying to like break it down. Um, so we call the cops. They show up to get a report. They get our side of the story first and then they're going to go over to the neighbor. And, but my mum, who's still bawling her eyes out, stops them, um, stops the police and said, when you go over there, I'm sorry. When you when you go over there, can you can you tell her that my name is Rebecca? And they go, "We thought your name was Rachel. We have you named down as Rachel. Is it is it Rebecca? No, it is Rachel. But I want her to think that my name is Rebecca. So why do you want her to think that your name is Rebecca? And then my mom said, "Just to stuff her around a little bit." And they did. And so now, whenever my mom sees this neighbor, the neighbor will say. I'm going to get you sometime, Rebecca. And my mom will just go, <laughs> and it works. I'm not scared anymore. You know, I, um, yeah, so I get, I get it from her, I think. I've spent a lot of my time trying to come up with jokes to make myself laugh. Um, I have some jokes that I prepared earlier. Um, you'd think I'd have some jokes. I'm a comedian. No, I have some financial reports I'm going to pass out later. Let's talk about the fiscal year. Um, no, I have some jokes that I, I'd like to share. Um, isn't it ironic? that the word lisp has an S in it. So that the people that need to say it the most are also the people that can't say it at all. I would call that despicable. And why is it, why is it that phone quality hasn't improved since 1876? Know what I mean? Like we've got 4K cameras built into the back, HD screens to project pixel perfection. We can connect to satellites and the internet we can communicate to people from you know, hemisphere away without a minute of latency but as soon as they start speaking all we're going to hear is <laughs> press one <laughs> i don't know what that was maybe you're talking to a rabbit dog over the phone you know what i mean um here's another joke um here's the last one uh so ghosting uh people have heard the term ghosting um, have you ever been ghosted? Uh, I have. And um, a lot of people call it ghosting because they think uh, the person doing the ghosting, um, they disappear like a ghost. Um, it's actually, that's not why it's called that. It's called that because whenever it happened to me, I died a little inside. You have to laugh. Um, yeah, I have a hard time letting things go, obviously. Um, one of my favorite pastimes is to uh, look at the facebook profiles of people who used to bully me just to you know just just a bit of retribution to me to see their profile pictures you know with the doc face you know low angle pushing their bicep up in frame and it's like i told you he was a douchebag i've been saying it for years like like there was this one guy right he had dyed his hair bleach blonde so it looked invisible like he looked bold basically like, and that's a hard look to pull off. Like, Eminem barely made it work. This was less like Eminem and more Egg. So Egghead uh, dyed his hair bleach blonde and made a whole post about it like anyone cared, like to give some sort of reason as to why to make this, and I'm using my words very carefully here, bold new hairstyle. What reason could he possibly have besides being an attention-seeking tryhard who'd peaked in high school? This is what the post said. Dying my hair in solidarity with my father who is fighting cancer and currently undergoing chemo. I'm sorry. Still a stupid haircut. But I just, you know, but they're not there anymore. You know, the bullies in my life. They're not in my life anymore. So I need to, Stop pretending like they are. Because even though they're gone, you know, there are those voices that are still in my head and I'm always trying to please them, always trying to fit in. 
Like, I just want people to like me. Like, that is my, that is my top one priority. And maybe that's why I don't feel like an adult. Because all this stuff I've been doing, I've been doing for them. And not even for just the people I hate, but the people that I love. You know, my family, my friends. I'm doing this because I thought that's what they would want me to do. And even all the stuff I've been doing, you know, you know, getting married, you know, getting a job, having kids, uh, stuff that was all told to me that I should be doing. And that was stuff I was, most of it was told to me as a kid by kids. Like, we didn't know what we were doing back then. Like, I remember as a kid, I thought the word spy was interchangeable with the word Nazi. So on bring your parents to school day, which coincided with bring your grandparents to school day, and my friend came out wearing a fake mustache, I yelled out, he's a Nazi! And, but I'm not autistic. I just, but I've been doing this because I was told this is what I should do to be an adult. But maybe they're wrong. Because I don't feel like an adult when I'm doing those things. Like to me, I feel like an adult when I'm doing the things that I thought I'd never be able to do because I was too scared. You know, yes, I don't have a job, but I've gone food shopping before, which, you know, doesn't sound like a big deal, but it was a big deal to me. Um, The people that run those stores are idiots, by the way, because I got sent there to get some salsa dip, right? Just to get some salsa dip. That's it. Just some salsa dip. And so I go, so where's the salsa dip going to be kept? Well, there is a dip section and salsa dip is dip. And what's the first dip of when you think of dip? Salsa dip. So you go to the dip section and you look, go through all the dips and there's no salsa dip. So you ask one of the people that works there, hey, excuse me, sir, do you know where the salsa dip is? And they go, oh, it's in the international foods aisle. It's called a dip. Yeah, okay. And then you go, okay, maybe all the foods with foreign sounding words in them go in the international foods aisle. Mission ships. Mission is a very Western word. Like mission accomplished. We got Bin Laden. God bless America. You're an idiot. You know, yes, I don't have a child. Um, that I know of, uh, <laughs> but, but at least I'm interesting. You know, at least I have stories to tell. At work the other day, I was in a half hour conversation with someone that started with, there was supposed to be a storm yesterday and there wasn't. You don't think I know that? We work in the same place, you idiot. And I do have a girlfriend though. Um, and I'm the idiot in that situation because, um, I thought they were going to rob me when we first met. Um, We met through Tinder, and um, we decided to meet in person for the first time at an abandoned train station. For the record, I did not know it was abandoned when I agreed to meet there. Just a fun little surprise for my terrified brain. And um, so I get there, I see them walking towards me, and I see that they have a friend next to them. And so my first thought was, hello, double trouble, here I come. Uh, no, that's not my first, my first thought was, oh God, I can't even handle one. And so, uh, they're walking towards me and then the guy, uh, want the friend starts walking, just drifting off to the side. Um, like they're going to walk around me like a pincer maneuver. That's a war tactic. I'm going to die. And I just thought, okay, I need to calm down. I need to, I'm being paranoid. Obviously nothing is wrong. I just need to stay calm and make a good impression for this person. And then they get to me finally, and uh, literally the first thing they say to me was, hey, can I see your wallet? And I say, get back, witch! Turns out they wanted to see my wallet to check my ID to see if I was who I said I was. Um, I didn't know know that when I uh, threw dirt in their eye and drove off. Um, But they're my girlfriend now. Um, Thanks to them, the amount of times I've had sex uh, has increased from four and a half to four and nine tenths. So you do the maths. I know I did. Um, so at the end of all that, I'm still not an adult. But I think being an adult maybe means different things to different people. To me, I think being an adult means having independence, you know, independence of choice, you know, doing the things that you're afraid to do, not to prove something to anyone, but because underneath all that fear, there is a need or want to do that thing.
Um, and maybe that's not a satisfying ending to this show. Um, but this isn't me giving up. I will be an adult, but I had to go through all this to to learn how to get there. Um, and hopefully by the time Act Three of my stand-up trilogy epic comes out, I am an adult. Uh, but for now, I'm 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 okay with being on my my Act Two. So yeah, not a great ending. But maybe if I loop things back to my first show. Um, I can give you somewhat of a conclusion to this story. So, um, in my first show, um, I talk about um, the first time I went to a party with alcohol at it, and I talk about all the different types of drunk people, but um, at the end of the night, um, in the next morning, they're all the same, saying, I don't want to go to uni. That was um, something that was actually said to me. Um, there was a girl at the party, and... Um, she sat next to me and she said, I don't think I want to go to uni. Um, I'm going to a uni that none of my friends are going to, that no one in this school is going to, and I'm not going to know anyone, and I'm scared. I don't think I want to go to uni. And I don't know why she confided in me, but she did. Um, and so I had to support her, and to do that, I lied and said, you'll be fine. Like I just, at times like this, I you know, pretend to be a much more confident and self-assured person. Um, and maybe I will become that person someday if I listen to some of the speeches I give. Um, then I made up a speech sort of like, you know, everyone feels alone. Everyone feels like they have, that they, that they're isolated. So don't deny it, embrace it because it's what makes us human. And to deny it is what truly isolates us. And so she ended up going to uni that year, um, the university that no one she knew was going to. And um, she met the love of her life there. You know, they got married. They had a wedding. And I wasn't invited. You can't. If it wasn't for me, no one would have been holding your hair back when you threw up in the Doritos. And this is the thanks I get. Unbelievable. If I had been invited, I wouldn't have gone, obviously. But if I had gone, I wouldn't have given a speech. But if I had given a speech, it would have gone something like this. Attention, everyone. I'd like to give a speech to the lovely uh, bride and groom. Congratulations to Nicole and her husband. Um, oh, God, what's the husband's name? Um, I don't think I actually met him. It doesn't matter. Um, saying things like the husband's name doesn't matter is probably why I wasn't invited. Um, I'm so happy to be uh, a part of this day, the celebration of love. There's, there's really nothing better than to be here for this, um, to celebrate your love. You know, this is your day. You know, you've earned this. But if I can make this day about me for a moment, I, um, I've been through a lot these past five years trying to become an adult like these newlyweds over here. Uh, for so long, I've been trying to fit in and do what I think you all want me to do. But if I've learned anything over these past few years, and I hope I've been able to get that point across in this show, is that you're all idiots. <laughs> and I'm not saying I'm any better, but you have to admit being part of the royal you isn't as all as cracked up as you make it out to be. <laughs> So, I'm going to start living my life and not yours. I'm going to become an adult my own way because that's what real adults do. I feel like I've alienated a lot of you by calling you idiots. So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm um, just going to pass on um, just the old phrase that, you know, has gotten me through some hard times, um, something that. To, you know, when things are tough, when things aren't looking good and you're worried about yourself, just something to tell yourself that, you know, you are okay and you are fine. It's an old Taiwanese saying that I learned many years ago, and I would like you to all repeat it with me. Now, this is the audience participation part of the show. Obviously, I'm not able to fact check if you're playing along, but the video is free. If you could do this for me, um, that includes you, mom. Uh, so... Repeat after me. Away you are, Fizz Conchan. 
มีเพนไรคุคุนทีแทง Thanks for asking. All right, that was supposed to be confetti, and it wasn't on the screen at all. But who cares? My name has been Rebecca. Good night. Yes. Show's over. I'm waving. Get out of here.